The Constitution seems clear on the separation of powers. It states that Congress makes the laws, the chief executive enforces them, and the Supreme Court determines their constitutionality. It was written that way by the Founding Fathers to ensure that no one branch of the federal government became too powerful. The three branches would balance each other and keep each other in check. Today, the reality is much more complex. This has led some presidents to issue what are called signing statements. Modern presidents use them to object to certain parts of a law, give instructions to agencies in the executive branch on how to implement a law, and even to say a law is unconstitutional and should not be enforced. One of the most controversial signing statements was issued by President Bush in 2005. It was in response to a law that included an amendment introduced by Senator John McCain. The amendment banned the torture and degrading treatment of prisoners. First, subjecting prisoners to abuse leads to bad intelligence because under torture, a detainee will tell his interrogator anything to make the pain stop. Second, mistreatment of our prisoners endangers U.S. troops who might be captured by the enemy, if not in this war, then in the next. The president strongly opposed the legislation, but a veto-proof majority in Congress forced him to reverse his position. Senator McCain has um, been a leader to make sure that uh, the United States of America upholds the values of America as we fight and win this war on terror, and we've been happy to work with him. The president signed the bill into law in December of 2005, but he issued a signing statement saying he would only enforce the law based on his view of the Constitution. You see, what we're always doing is making sure that we make it clear that President, the executive branch has got certain responsibilities. Conducting war is a responsibility in the executive branch, not the legislative branch. That raised the question, where do signing statements fit into the constitutional separation of powers? Joining us now, two people with different views on signing statements. Judge Patricia Wald served on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit from 1979 to 1999. Judge Wald also participated in a committee that studied presidential signing statements for the American Bar Association, the nation's largest group representing lawyers. Also joining us is Nicholas Quinn Rosencrantz, an associate professor of law at Georgetown Law School. During the first administration of President George W. Bush, he worked in the U.S. Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel. The office advises the president on constitutional issues and helps draft presidential signing statements. Professor Rosencrantz has testified about signing statements before both the House Judiciary Committee and the Senate Judiciary Committee. Welcome to you both. Thanks, Ron. Professor Rosencrantz, what is the president's proper role in making and interpreting laws? Bills are presented to him to sign, and if he signs them, they become a law. And then the president executes the law. Uh, that's his constitutional duty, to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. And uh, the president, in the course of issuing these signing statements, just simply says what he thinks the laws mean. So his job is going to require him to uh, execute the law, and in order to execute it, you need to know what it means. And he just gives us some indication of what he thinks the statute means. Once the president signs a law, is, is it his responsibility to comply with the law that he has signed? It is his responsibility to comply with the law that it, he has signed, um, unless perhaps some part of the law is unconstitutional. Judge Wald, let me ask for your interpretation of that. What is the president's role properly? When I go back to the Constitution itself, Congress passes a law, both houses pass a law by a majority vote. It's presented to the president. The president, according to the Constitution, uh, is to approve it, uh, is to sign it and approve it, or he may veto it. And if he vetoes it, he states his objections. It goes back to both houses of Congress. Each house has then to repass it by a two-thirds vote if it is to become law. Otherwise, it will just uh, die. So I think that gives us the framework or the perimeters about the president's power. And of course, he does have to execute the laws. So when you interpret this idea about whether the president is forced to comply, you say that he is, he is, he is confined by what the Constitution says, and that's that unless he vetoes it, he has to comply. I would say yes. My interpretation and that of the American Bar Association task force that I served on uh, is once the president has approved the law and signed it, then he is required to execute it. I think the president 
can very well in a signing statement say the Supreme Court has already said that particular piece of this legislation is unconstitutional and I'm not going to uh, enforce it. But the big difference to me and I think to the ABA task force is that it is the court the Supreme Court under Article 3 that declares what the law is and must declare that a law is unconstitutional, not the president. Well, let's pick up on that point, Professor Rosencrantz. You, if I heard you correctly, you said that it's the president has the latitude to determine whether there is some portion of the law which, in fact, is not constitutional, not necessarily Congress or the court. The executive branch for uh, decades, centuries, really, has taken the position that it is that the president has an independent obligation to assess the constitutionality of laws. So it's quite right that courts have the power and the duty to um, say what the law is, but uh, presidents also and congressmen also have an independent obligation to weigh the constitutionality of legislation. And the executive branch for uh, decades has taken the position that the president is not obliged to enforce an unconstitutional provision of law. Is this something which is unusual what President Bush has been doing, especially in this particular case with the McCain torture amendment? I really think it's not unusual at all. Presidents have been issuing signing statements really from the beginning, and the presidential signing statements generally, as I said, are just the president letting Congress know and letting the American people know the, his interpretation of a statute, what he thinks the statute means. And sometimes, as in the McCain statement, um, the Constitution gives him a hint what it means. So he says, this statute's uh, ambiguous, it could mean one thing or it could mean another thing, but I assume that Congress meant to pass a constitutional statute, and if I interpret it this way, it will be constitutional, and therefore I assume this is what Congress meant. There are instances in which past presidents have said, usually about a very specific thing, I don't think that this is constitutional. What has happened in recent years, however, is the current president has said about a particular provision in a law, in a signing statement, I'm going to sign this but I am going to interpret it in a way that will not interfere with what my version of my constitutional powers are under the unitary president and in the case of the McCain Amendment. What that signing statement does in effect is say, I'm going to enforce this in a way that I think is constitutional or that I think does not interfere with my prerogative powers. That makes him the final interpreter of the constitutionality even if Congress has passed this law saying in effect since it passed it we think it's constitutional. Professor Rosencrantz, is that, what's, is that what's happening? In the huge majority of presidential signing statements, both this president's and all prior presidents, these statements do not say, I think this statute is unconstitutional. They do not say, I'm not going to enforce this statute. They expressly don't say that. What they say instead is, um, I have to interpret this statute. I have to figure out what it means in order to execute it. And one way that presidents, just like courts, figure out what a statute means is by reference to the Constitution. At what point does the president's action, the president's interpretation, begin to compromise that separation of powers that the Constitution envisioned between the Congress and the executive? Well, I think the president's, the president's act of interpreting a statute can never be a threat to the separation of powers because it's the, it, it is inherent in what a president does. He, cannot do his job if he cannot figure out what the law means. So he takes his best crack at figuring out what Congress meant when they wrote the statute in light of the Constitution. Now, it's possible that we may disagree about a particular president's reading of a particular statute. We could have conversations about that. We may disagree about what quite the McCain Amendment meant, the one you referenced at the beginning. But as a general matter, the president's power is to execute the law and you just can't do that without figuring out what the law means. Judge Walt, Walt, is the president's best crack good enough? No, I don't think so. I think it's perfectly within his appropriate powers to say in his signing statement, this is an ambiguous law, but here's my interpretation. Exactly. There are many instances, and I would say the McCain Amendment was one, where it is not an ambiguous statute. It says no U.S. personnel shall invoke cruel, degrading, or inhuman treatment on any prisoner held. That seems pretty straightforward. And so I think where Congress makes its intent clear, 
I don't think the president has the prerogative to say, I may think it's ambiguous, so I'm going to interpret it in a certain way uh, that will make me feel good. Professor Rosencrantz got the first word. Judge Wall gets the last word. For more information on signing statements and the Constitution, please visit annenbergclassroom.org. I'm Gwen Eiffel.